Welcome to the Hardwood Hustle powered by PGC Basketball. We believe in the value of a coach. We're here to educate, empower, and encourage you to lead like never before. This week, we welcome Devin Durant to the show, an All-American at BYU, former NBA player, successful real estate investor, and inspirational speaker. He's authored a book titled The Values Delta. In this episode, he shares practical advice on how coaches can create a meaningful difference in their programs and communities by focusing on values. Welcome back to the Hardwood Hustle. Really excited for our guest today. We're going to talk everything from hoops to leadership development, how to advance your career, how to do better at your job. Devin Durant, who is a jack of all trades, a former NBA player, played at BYU. He's also an author, and we'll talk about those books here, and also is uh, being very successful in the real estate world as well. And so you as coaches, I know many of you are thinking about how to improve myself. How do I become better at leadership? How do I become uh, better at diversifying and just really enhance my career? So Devin, welcome to the show. Thank you, TJ. It's good to be with you and Sam this morning. Well, so let's let's dive right in. Let's just talk. If you could just give a little bit of background on some of the things maybe you're doing now and have done in the past so our, our listeners can kind of get to know who you are a little bit. Well, if we turn the clock back a few years, uh, I was... I was raised in Utah and Kentucky during my junior high school and and high school years. And then, like you mentioned, uh, played basketball at Brigham Young University. Took some time to serve a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints during that period. And then got into, uh, spent some time in the NBA. Didn't last long, but uh, uh, would have liked it. It would have lasted a little bit longer, but it was a wonderful experience there to play against uh, some of uh, the men that I looked up to so much growing up and then entered the, played some in Europe, uh, entered the corporate world, spent about four years there and then a uh, partner and I, we, we went down the entrepreneurial path and I've been a real estate investor for the last 25 years and uh, just over the last about eight years, been working on a, a book, try to get some of my ideas clear on on how uh, important our values are for us in athletics and in business and, and in our personal lives. I'm father of six wonderful children and 16 amazing grandchildren. So that that's a quick overview. Yeah, uh, that's a full-time job in itself. I know I just, uh, Sam has three and I have four and yeah, that can be a, a full-time job in itself, but you've, you've ventured out into a lot of different fields. And we were talking previously just about how coaches have impacted you and how they've made such a big difference um, in your life and have helped you to learn a lot of these skills to help you be successful um, as an author, be successful as a real estate investor, and to have a really good basketball career. So let's share some of those tips. I mean, what are some of the things that, uh, you know, first of all, before we get into the things that you've done, the success that you've had, what are some of the things that springboarded you there? Some things that coaches invested or taught to you that you think are really valuable for, uh, you know, coaches these days to be in, investing and in, in, in pouring into their athletes? Well, thanks for that, 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 that open door, TJ. Uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, we don't have 10 or 20 hours here to talk about the amazing coaches that I've had. Uh, I'll just share a story or two. You know, I think back to my high school coach. Well, actually, let me say this, just to put it all into context. Uh, it, you know, if, if you ask your listeners, you know, write down the 10 people who've had the greatest impact on your life and exclude family members. And I was just thinking about that. Probably if I put down 10, I think four of them would be coaches. And, and I've just had tremendous coaches every step of the way. And so one example uh, is in my high school coach is a man named Jim Spencer. And he, he helped me in so many ways. But I remember as a young sophomore in high school, I walked into his gym uh, and I just moved from Kentucky to Utah and walked into the gym the first day. It was middle of the summer. He had a camp going on and he, he called everybody together 
And so there I was, the new kid, and he said, I want to introduce uh, you to the Provo High basketball players. And then the thing I remember he said, he said, we are the UCLA of Utah high school basketball. And this was a time when, you know, the wooden years where they were winning national championships time and time again. And, and, and so one of the things that he did from day one was he, he set a level of expectation for us as high school kids that he expected excellence out of us. And he, he, he wanted to provide a model for us and, and as part of that expectation. And so I knew right at that point that a lot was going to be asked of me, that his expectation was that we would win the state championship. And I, I loved his, his approach, the optimism that he had and, and the belief in his players that he had. That's just one quick example of how he impacted uh, my life and, and my understanding of what it was going to take to excel in basketball. Yeah, I love that story, Devin, because it's so true. Like a lot of good coaches, that's what they do. They, they inspire belief in yourself that we sometimes don't even have in ourselves. And so they get players to, you know, believe in themselves more and aspire for more and go for more. And so I love that story because that highlights that. It was just even hearing you say it and stuff TJ and I talk, you know, daily, weekly about, but your story is just another good reminder. You know, as you, you, I love this, also the 10 people who've influenced you. And so you mentioned Jim Spencer. Let's stay on this theme about coaches. What's another big takeaway you had from maybe another coach in your life that uh, still sticks with you today? Well, let me, let me share uh, one from my junior high. I'm sure we have some junior high coaches out there. And my, my son is about to coach some, the seventh grade team. Uh, in, in his community, and I told him, you know, don't underestimate how much influence you have, even on these young kids, because probably the most influential coach I had in my life was when I was an eighth grader, and, and uh, at the time, I was, uh, I, I, I was, I wasn't amounting to much as a basketball player, but there was an opportunity for the ninth grade tryouts. And so you might be getting more than what you asked for on this one, Sam, but here we go. Uh, and, and so I tried out for the ninth grade team thinking, there's nothing to lose here. And when I get cut, I'll go back and come play on the seventh and eighth grade team, the, the junior high team. And I thought it might be helpful to play against the older guys. So uh, I, Surprisingly, I made the ninth grade team as an eighth grader, and I was quite excited about that, but my excitement quickly uh, vanished when I realized how hard the ninth grade coach was. He was, was very demanding. He was a get-in-your-face kind of coach, and I, I thought, wow, what have I gotten myself into? This, this is a mistake, but I wasn't about to quit. At the same time, I played on the seventh and eighth grade team. So I'm going back and forth a little bit, but I'm practicing with the ninth grade team and playing games with the seventh and eighth grade team, as well as the ninth grade team. So this coach, his name is Rick Bolas, and <clears throat> Rick was just so demanding. And here I am, I'm just this uh, young boy, and he's expecting us to work like men. But anyway, it was it was very difficult. He stretched us, and and then one time the seventh and eighth grade coach he came and he he said, "Hey Devin, you know we've got an important game this week. W would you be able to practice with us during the week in preparation for this important seventh and eighth grade team?" Well, that wasn't the norm. I was practicing with the ninth grade team, so I went to the coach and I said, "Hey." Uh, the coach from the eighth grade team's wondering if I can practice with them this week. And he said, well, what would you prefer to do? And so I hemmed and hawed, I, you know, in my heart, I wanted to be with the younger guys. And I said, well, we've got an important game coming up. So it's would probably be good to practice with the seventh and eighth grade team. 
And this, so his response to that, he looked me in the eye and he said, I never want to see you again. So you know, I'm just a little eighth grade kid. And so I walked out of there, didn't quite know what to do. Uh, but the next day I showed up at the ninth grade practice and he didn't say anything to me, but in his own way, it might not be the way other coaches would do it, but it's in his own way. He taught me don't avoid hard things. Uh, don't, don't, don't take the easy route. Uh, if you want to excel, it's going to be tough. It's going to be demanding. It's not always going to be easy and comfortable. And <clears throat> He, he had such an impact on me. I, I hated every second of practice during that eighth grade year with him, but I, I love the man and I can't say enough good about him for the positive impact that he had on me uh, throughout my life. One thing I'll just end with this, you know, I had a, a lot of other coaches throughout my life, but none of them were as tough as my eighth grade coach, uh, Rick Bolas. He prepared me. For, for everything that I was going to come up against in, in, in the, in the future years. You know, it's, it's really interesting that uh, how often basketball is just a microcosm of life, you know, how you learn these lessons and, and thankfully on the basketball court, they're, they're not uh, as important as they are just in the game of life, but they help you to prepare for life. The lessons you, you learn through the game and, Two that we've talked about already is just overcoming adversity and how coaches, you know, have helped you be able to overcome that adversity. And then the standard being set high. And I think these two things have probably prepared you for a lot of things in life, you know, from writing your books to real estate. Can you just talk about how those two lessons, how a high standard and a high level of accountability and the ability to face adversity has prepared you as a father, as a grandfather, as, as an employee, as an employer, um, just how they've translated for you in different ways? Sure, sure. I, I, I worked for WordPerfect Corporation for a time after playing in, in, in the NBA and developed a friendship there, a guy named Pete Peterson. We became very close and later in the later years we became business partners. But one thing he said once was, he, he said uh, he liked to hire athletes because when he would have to have a direct conversation with them, they were, they were resilient. They would bounce back quickly. It wasn't like, hey, I, I, need, I need to uh, say some strong things to you here. And, and then he would lose them for a week or two uh, because <laughs> they weren't accustomed to being criticized in any way. And that, that really, really stuck with me because that's, I think, one of the values that I've developed is, is resiliency. When, when you have a coach who's demanding, uh, you have that trial, you have that adversity. And, and for all of us, we've all talked about this, where uh, the value of losing, you know, I, I often say I, I, I never learned much from winning. Um, but I, I sure could learn a lot from losing. Uh, the, and oftentimes losing makes the winning more sweet. So it's not anything any of us are seeking. Hey, let's go see if we can lose this game so we can learn something and appreciate the wins more. But, but obviously it happens to all of us. You know, in my case, uh, my sophomore and junior year in high school, we got to the state tournament, went to the semifinals of the state, and lost. That was my sophomore year. My junior year, same thing, semifinals of state, and we lost. But those two losses were, were critical in preparing us for a senior year when, you know, when fortunately, we didn't lose any games and, and finally got that state championship. But I think that's one of the key qualities of a great coach is taking advantage is taking advantage of the teaching moments that come from uh, defeats. Yeah, that's so good. You know, 
adversity. We had Tony Bennett on here, and he talked about being the number one seed being knocked out, you know, first ever number one seed being knocked out by a 16 seed. And, you know, reading that excerpt in your book, you talked about that, Devin. You know, you were, I think you led the country in scoring for almost the entire senior year at BYU, right? And then you're in the, uh, are you, you're in the best draft class ever, maybe with Hakeem and Michael Jordan, all those guys. But you, I say all that to say you, you've had the highest of highs, you've had some lows. And, you know, you talk about the your values. And I think for coaches, like, what are your values? How do they guide you? Deciding who you want to be. And I think sometimes as people, as fathers, as coaches, as mothers, as people, we are focusing on doing the next thing. And we don't stop and decide who do we want to be in our lives or who do we want to be as coaches. So maybe talk about that. Just how do you, you know, if TJ and I said, hey, help us become more aware of who we are and identifying who we want to be how would you coach us into you know making that a priority yeah great question and I, th- that that's really one of the purposes of, of writing this book the values delta is i really ask three questions one question is what are your values so, so I, i'm not really trying to tell people hey here are the values you should have uh it, it's really a question which is what values have you chosen? And I call them priority values because I I think our values can change over time, depending on our different circumstance. So in in the book, I I outlined what are my priority values. Uh, But again, I asked them to, to, to do that. And then the second question is, what do you value? And the third question is, how are you going to create Delta? So with that, you know, if you look at uh, in, in basketballs in, in, with, with a team, you said, all, all right, as a team, what are our values? Well, one of our values is selflessness. We are a team of selfless players. And then the next question is, what do you value? And one of the things we value is our, our teammates and our coaches. So then the third question is, how do you create Delta or, or make a difference, make a positive difference? And the, so, so then the discussion becomes, how does selflessness impact my teammates and my coaches? How, what, we want that hopefully to translate into some victories and some relationships that can last, last a lifetime and positive experiences. And so that's the essence of it is identifying what our values are, identifying what's most important, and then finding that harmony uh, to truly make a difference. So Devin, when you wrote the book, you know, obviously there's something kind of burning within you that you felt like, gosh, this could really add value to people. So what was the burning desire to help people to discover that and, and, uh, if that was it, or if there was something else, and what could that do for them? Yeah, I think the burning desire for me is is uh, uh, I wanted to reach back and see what what could I share that might be helpful. And through my real estate years, my focus was adding value to properties. And if I buy a house or an apartment building. Uh, how can I add value to that property? You know, so obviously in that way, I, I feed my family, provide a living by adding value to a physical asset. But as I thought more about that, I thought, yeah, I enjoy real estate, and, uh, but is there a way we could add value to people to, to, how can we add value to ourselves, to our friends, to our family, to our, our associates? And so that was the, really the genesis uh, of the book was just a spirit of, I, I've been so fortunate. As I mentioned, I've had some coaches that have added tremendous value to my life and to many others and also other mentors in life. And my hope was that maybe somehow in some small way, 
I might be able to share something that would inspire others uh, to make positive difference in their lives. Devin, what's a mistake you made in your leadership that really propelled you to be a better leader um, and mentoring other people? Yeah, I, I had one. Uh, well, after I graduated from BYU, years passed, and I always wanted to go back and get an uh, advanced degree. And so finally things worked out, and, and I went back and got an MBA at the University of Utah. And so through that process, just had some great classmates, wonderful teachers, very positive experience, gave me a lot of confidence uh, in, in business, and I'd had some success in real estate. And, and so I, 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 I got involved in a, another business, a restaurant business, and everything went wrong from the very beginning. You know, and I, I think I, I must have lost over a million dollars on this investment. And I, when I look back on that, I, I think just a couple of things. One, I didn't do my homework. And, and two, I think I really lacked humility. I think I was at a point where, yeah, I can go in and I can do this and everything's going to work out just fine. <clears throat> so I took some shortcuts that were just unwise and learned some costly lessons that, <clears throat> you know, stay humble and, and do your homework. And, uh, and, and so fortunately, I, uh, I, I try to, like I said, <laughs> learn from your defeats and learn from your failures in business. Yeah. Let's stay on that for a second. You know, I've always said, be good to the game and the game will be good to you. My dad was a longtime high school coach and he told me that many a times over the course of years. And a big part of that was um, just remaining humble. And, and Lenny Acuff, Sam, tell me if I uh, say this wrong, but he has a great, Great, great quote. He's the coach at Lipscomb University, and he says, "There's two types of coaches: those that are humbled, and those who are about to be humbled." <laughs> and and uh, I, I think it's so true, you know. And we we work in such a I don't want to say I, I, there's a lot of ego in sport, you know. Everybody's winning, everybody's trying to compete, and and and, uh, and there's undoubtedly ego within players and coaches, and we all fall, you know, prey to it, but. What does having humility do for you? You know, I, we all know it's important, but what does it actually do for you? Well, in a, in a, in a way, <clears throat> I think it impacts you profoundly in all areas of your life. I think part of it is, is recognizing that it's not all about us. It's not all about you as the coach. Uh, it, it, it's a, you know, for lack of a better way to say it, it, it's a team effort. And I think as we recognize the importance of each piece of the puzzle, uh, I, I think that it inherently just invites humility. Uh, you know, but for whatever reason, we fall into the trap of thinking, Hey, I did this or I did that, and and it, it, it's easy to to fall into that ego trap. Uh, I think it's human nature, but I, I think it for it's you know it's a constant effort, and that, that's part of what I emphasize in in the the book is take you know our, we we all have a certain set of values, but if we don't take time to focus on a value or a few values at a time, it, it's easy to, to let them go to the wayside. And I think humility is one that should always be very close at hand because if we lose that, uh, like you say, it's only a matter of time before we get humbled in one form or another. Devin, let me ask you this. So a lot of times I think coaches have values. I think teams have values. 
One of the really difficult things is getting values to stick. You know, Sam alludes to this a lot. You know, everybody puts it up in the locker room and everybody puts it on the back of a T-shirt, but not everybody and probably a high percentage don't actually live them out. So what have you found as key over time to ensure that you're actually making these values bringing life to these values, making sure they stick, making sure they're actually happen, making sure that you're accountable to them, teaching them. What are some things coaches can do to, to not just put them out there, not just answer the questions, but make them stick? Yeah, TJ, I was listening to you and, and you said the, the word that, that I was going to use, which is accountable. There has to be some level of accountability. And so in the book, I, I provide what I call the report card. So the report card is just a simple way to provide accountability, to, to assess progress or assess delta. And, and so the idea of the report card is you choose a value that you're going to focus on. And I really like what you said is, you know, we have them on the wall and we have them on our T-shirt. But if you ask the guys on your team or the girls on your team, what are our team values? Would they remember them? Or would they have to look at the back of their t-shirt to see what our, their values are? So through the report card, it's just a way to focus on a particular value for a period of time and to measure progress. So I, I, in my world, my simple world, I, I like to think of it as, okay, here's a starting point and here's an end point. Did anything happen that was different? Did that value impact uh, me or someone else or our team in any way? Uh, if it didn't, do I need to continue to focus on it or is it time to shift to another value? But I, I think without that accountability piece, uh, not much good is gonna happen. If we give the speech at the first of the year and say, here are our six values, and the guys or girls don't hear about them for a month or two or three. It's as if the speech was never given. I think there needs to be weekly follow-up, weekly clarity, weekly focus on what our values are and how, how they're going to influence our group, our company, our team, our organization. Yeah, I, let, let's stay on that for a second, this accountability piece. So... A, co a popular quote, you may have heard it, Devin, in the last probably 10 years, I think, in coaching has been this. It is, a player-led team is better than a coach-led team. Have you heard that before? I haven't. And it, and it sounds... Oh, you haven't? But I agree. So a, co a coach may stand up in the locker room or after a frustrating you know, loss or practice and you know, they'll say it and they'll let it stand on itself thinking they want the players to take control of the team and hold each other accountable. And I think in theory, that's really good. And that's, and I think we all want that as coaches and, and it's, and there's a lot of truth in it, but the problem and the gap is that coaches are saying it yet. We're not teaching players how to live it out and how to hold each other accountable because you know, how I speak to TJ is different than how I speak to Chris and different than John. There's a baseline level that we may all operate at, and that, that goes to relationships. But how do you, you know, you think about businesses you run and teams you've been on. How do you effectively get the whole organization to be accountable to one another? And I would even, last thing to, sorry, last thing I'll say to this is, when a player can hold a coach accountable too, I think that's pretty special. I don't know that happens very much, uh, but coaches fall short. We fall short of who we want to be. I mean, that's just normal. So how do you bring that to life where the whole organization's rowing the boat in the same direction? Well, it's certainly a challenge uh, for, for leaders, for coaches across the board. I, I think that's where the the – the great rise to the top, they're able to do that. They're able to, uh, through leadership and training and coaching, they're, they're able to allow their players to
to, to blossom and grow and to recognize the importance of their leadership role. Uh, it, 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 uh, again, it's so easy to say, so hard to do, but I think over time, that's what you see with the great coaches is over time, there's, there's a coach on the floor. And how do we develop that? A lot of different ways that that might happen. But I think in the context of what I'm talking about is, is how can a, a player take ownership of, uh, or an employee? If, if, if these are the values of our team, this is the culture that we're going to have. Uh, how, how can these players embrace that? And, and I think it's simply through the coach modeling it, teaching it, showing how it's done, and then giving the players and the employees the opportunity to take the lead. And they'll certainly stumble, but that's the value of having a good coach or leader to help them through those rough spots, give them other opportunities. And through repetition and training, I think that's when the, the cream can really rise to the top and the coaches can enjoy the luxury of having a, another coach uh, on on the floor or, or in the boardroom. Devin, I liked uh, earlier how you talked about how sometimes values change over time. And, you know, let's just say that you're a new coach and you're trying to pick values or you're trying to get players to, to commit to those values. So I think we each choose our own values, but having other players buy into our values is, is a whole nother thing. Like, so how do you, I got a two part question. How do you get other people to buy into those values? And the second one is this is, do you think over time that eventually you really kind of land on your core values, but they evolve? For instance, I think of all the times I've had teams and we've had these different values and over the last five or six years, there's one value that is always there. Like I can't get away from it. And that's the value of gratitude. Like I just think a grateful team is an easy team to coach. And so while our values have evolved, gratitude is one that's like, it's just a staple. And so do you try out different values and realize, gosh, it sounded good, but it's not good. And, and just curious as to how those might evolve over time. Wow. The, the first of all, the buy-in piece, I think the, the, the key to buy-in for me is, is participation. So if you say you're at the beginning of the season and you bring the guys in, the girls, the ladies, you can say, all right, what are our, what are our, the values of our team this year? And you can have a discussion where there's a lot of give and take, or you can just walk in to the, the gym and say, here are our values. Uh, and, and I think that mis approach obviously is a mistake. So I think to get the buy-in, they have to feel like they're part of the process. That that's how I would answer that. This the second part with with how our values might change over time. It's interesting you bring up gratitude. Gratitude is one of my priority values, uh, and that that may never change. But for example, the, I, I think it's really based on need, and it comes from follow-up conversations. But, but let's just, for example, let's say that one of our values as a team is punctuality. You know, guys need to be to practice on time. So we're going to focus on that for, for two weeks. And it's a priority value for us because if we're going to run practice the way we want to, everybody needs to be here and you know, five minutes early or 10 minutes early. But that's one of our priority values. So after a couple of weeks or a month, we say, hey, th this is not an issue anymore. Everybody's showing up on time, and they have been doing that for four weeks or days or whatever. But now, what what what's what do we need now? Uh, well, maybe what we need now is is to focus more on uh, discipline off the court. You know, and this was something that my high school coach emphasized. He, you know, he said. You guys, when you leave practice, you can't go and you know, be drinking all this soda pop and eating all this junk food. You know, we, we need to have some uh, 
discipline for our diet. So maybe that becomes the value is self-discipline uh, away from the, the court. And that becomes a priority value for a period of time. But then you get to the point where, hey, we're on top of that one. So it's almost needs based, uh, based on the situation, based on, on, on the, the makeup of the team. And over time, as the, the accountability takes place and, and the, the, the self-assessment that takes place, I, I think we identify different, what I call priority values. I think core values, they're part of us. They may never change, but a priority value can shift over time based on uh, the needs at the moment. So in, in a team setting, how many priority values on a team would you have? Do you, do you ascribe to uh, less is more? Um, you know, what's the approach there? Because you know, some coaches that are new, they want to prioritize 14 things and you know, I'm not sure that the, all 14 are going to get accomplished. So what, what would be your approach there? You know, my, my approach would, would be let, let's identify maybe six to eight priority values. But, but again, like you say, if, if we try to tackle them all at once, everybody's going to be confused and lost. So I really emphasize the importance of the small and the simple. And in this particular case, I would say, okay, we've identified these six to eight values. Let's focus on them over two or three months. For starters, let's just focus on one value and how it impacts something that's important to us as a team. And uh, so that's the spirit of it is keep it as simple as possible, make the focus very clear and have a starting point and an end point and, and an opportunity to assess, did it make any difference? And if it makes a difference, boy, I would roll to the next value and I would keep the process going. If it doesn't make any difference, I'd either scrap the program or I'd say, okay, what went wrong here? Why was there no, no, no progress in this particular area? But that's, that's how I'd approach it. Keep it as simple and clear as you could. Devin, as we wind down here, I've got three final things for us, and I'll just go one at a time. One, what did we not talk about in leadership and, and values that you think is really important for, for leaders to hear that are listening right now? I think the one thing that, that I would emphasize is, is what kind of vision have we painted? What, what's the picture that we've painted? What, what's the desired outcome? And, and we've mentioned it a little bit, but I, I've always been impressed by leaders who, who seem to know where they're headed. They seem to know the destination and they have a plan as to how to get there. And I, I think that's powerful, particularly for younger girls and boys to, to see that in an adult leader. I think o over time, you know, we, we become a little hardened and, and it's more difficult to influence uh, our, our mindset. Um, but to take advantage, particularly in those, those, with those uh, that we have influence over who, who are more open to seeing what vision might be before them and to see the possibilities uh, of what might happen if I take different steps uh, to get where I want to be. Yeah. Well, Devin, thank you so much for all the wisdom that you drop. But before you leave, we got two more things. One, uh, we are the Hardwood Hustle, and you know coaches don't make a ton of money, so we need side hustles here. So what's what's the piece of real estate advice that you would you would drop on us for those of us looking for the side hustle? I love that idea. I think one of the most important investments that we all make is simply buying a home. And for all those coaches out there who don't have enough time to, to spend buying properties on the side, I would say just to educate yourself as to <clears throat> uh, 
real estate values in your particular area. And if you can gain an understanding of value and hopefully buy a home that may be a, a bit under value and then uh, you know, get your guys or girls to come over to your house on a weekend and you know paint the house, clean up the yard and maybe install some new carpet and upgrade the house, add some value to the house. And when that next coaching opportunity comes and you got to move to a different city, hopefully you can sell that house and, you know, put 20,000 or 40,000 or 60,000 or more in your pocket and go to your next city and, and find another house that, that may be a little bit under value. And so, yeah, you get to do what you love coaching the, uh, the coaching sports, but at the same time, simply by being wise, as you go from city to city, buy house to house, hopefully you can put a lot of money in your pocket over time. Yeah, I love it. So uh, wrapping us up here, Devin, what's the next steps? How do people stay in touch or, or get your book? Um, what things can you tell us to make sure? Because this is just tip of the iceberg, and I know a lot of coaches are going to want to go deeper. So what are next steps? Yeah, please, please uh, stop by my website, thevaluesdelta.com. You can reach me there. And also there's a, there's a bonus there where I've, uh, I had a video, uh, a, a short film created. It's an animated film about, uh, the value of quiet service. And it may be something you can show your, your, your team sometime to, to teach about values. It's only about 13 minutes long, kind of a fun video. It's a bit of a tearjerker. So bring some, some tissue along, uh, for the ride, but come check out, uh, the website, the Delta.com and, or <laughs> I'd love to come speak at your, your basketball camp, uh, here or there at your school. So you can find me, find me there at that, uh, at my website, the valuesdelta.com. And we'll, uh, We'll put that on our social media as well. And Devin, let me just say thanks for uh, coming on. It's always just good to hear wisdom. And I think good coaches heed good wisdom and appreciate you dropping all yours and sharing your knowledge with everybody here. It was a pleasure to talk with you and coaches go get the book, go check out the website. And we enjoy everybody uh, just taking the time to, to listen. So, hey, Devin, thanks so much. Really appreciate you. Hey, he is Sam Allen. I am TJ Rosine. And we are the Hardwood Hustle. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Hardwood Hustle, where we believe in the value of a coach. We want to bring you quality content and journey with you. Stay connected with us on Twitter and Instagram. You can find us at Harwood underscore hustle. From the Harwood Hustle team, thanks again. We can't wait to be with you again next week.